Before we go any further, I'm going to make a few obligatory announcements, the first of which is to please check your cell phones and make sure that they are set to either silent or vibrate or airplane mode or, God forbid, you might even turn it off. <laughs> um, but no, seriously, with all seriousness, please do put your cell phones on silent to make sure it doesn't interrupt the uh, conversation this evening. Thank you. We appreciate it. Um, you, uh, if you want to keep your cell phone on, uh, we encourage you to join the conversation online. We are actually uh, live tweeting this evening's event from our Twitter account at LePage Center. And the hashtag on the screen is uh, hashtag LePage at VU. So if you want to contribute to the conversation online or see what others are talking about on cyberspace, uh, please do log into Twitter and follow us that way. And if you're on Twitter, please do follow our account for more information about our upcoming events. I also want to let you know this evening that the event is being filmed both by Villanova University and by C-SPAN. Um, and the Villanova uh, filming is actually a live stream, so people remotely can watch the event. As it unfolds, the C-SPAN video will be available online and on American History TV in the weeks ahead. Um, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, my name is Jason Steinhauer, and I am the director of the LePage Center for History in the Public Interest here at Villanova University. Um, how many of you are joining us for the first time? Show of hands. Oh, quite a few. Well, welcome. We're delighted that you're here. Um, very briefly, the LePage Center is a relatively new project of Villanova University, uh, a collaboration between the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences and the Department of History. And our mission is to bring history to bear on contemporary issues, and we do that through a variety of means. We host public programs such as these. We have a blog where historians write for us about contemporary issues from a historical perspective. Uh, we create resources for teachers in the classroom. Uh, we've, in the midst of a collaboration with the Philadelphia Inquirer to infuse more historical scholarship into local journalism. And we do a number of different uh, things here on campus and out in the community. So if you're joining us for the first time, Welcome. We're delighted that you're here. We hope that you'll stay connected with us. We have a newsletter list you can sign up for outside. We have other programs and events that you can attend. So I hope this is the beginning of a, a long relationship with the LePage Center and with Villanova University. Um, for those of you who are new as well and those tuning in on C-SPAN or on our live stream, I should also let you know that this program is the fourth in a series that we have done this year on the subject of revisionist history. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, is revisionist history a contemporary issue that we need the LePage Center to address? Well, it's interesting. If you look in popular culture, you will find references to revisionist history in many, many places. In fact, how many of you have been following the Senate impeachment trial? Show of hands. You may have actually heard that the president's defense team invoked revisionist history, uh, what was it, yesterday or two days ago? Uh, during the trial and actually cited the New York Times 1619 project as a revisionist history project, which was something that we talked about in our first event on revising early America. So our, our purpose this year with these series of events has been to explore and challenge these questions about revision and actually to illuminate that scholarship and historical scholarship depends on revision. That's an inherent part of the historical process. Of course, with tonight's subject, the Holocaust, uh, the word revision and revisionism uh, can often have more nefarious or insidious um, affiliations. And so for that reason, I actually want to start tonight's event with a joint prepared statement that has been created by the LePage Center, and I'd like to read it in its entirety, if you'll allow me to. This, series, this year's series of roundtable discussions on revisionist history seeks to explore challenging historical topics and to introduce a public audience to the ways that revision necessarily informs all historical scholarship. Nonetheless, we are aware that in connection to this evening's topic, the term revisionism has often suggested a willingness to downplay or even deny Nazi Germany's mid 20th century efforts to exterminate Europe's Jewish population. We vigorously reject any effort to deny the well-documented history of that campaign of systematic mass murder. 
So in order to start off tonight's discussion on a clear foundation, we believe that it's important to reiterate any honest intellectual discussion of the evolving scholarship on the Holocaust must start by acknowledging the basic historical fact of the Holocaust. That said, I want to put up this slide for a moment as I because we have been exploring through this series of conversations why revision is important and what the revision that we envision relies upon. So historical scholarship necessitates looking at new sources, it necessitates new examinations, it ex necessitates expanding the interpretations, bringing in a diversity of perspectives, and it's an evolving process, right? Our understandings of these complex historical events is continually evolving and continually being enriched by new scholars and new scholarship. So this is the premise upon which our conversation rests tonight, because Holocaust scholarship is being continually revised, new ideas, new sources, new interpretations, and new scholars. And throughout these series of events and tonight, you will meet scholars who have offered fresh perspectives, have done interesting things and new research, and have helped us figure out what happened and why it matters for today. So let me now introduce you to the scholars on our panel who will be here for tonight's conversation. And I'll manipulate back to this slide. Uh, you may have seen in the uh, promotion for this event that uh, Tina Grossman of uh, Cooper Union in New York City was scheduled to join us. Unfortunately, she's not able to be with us this evening, but she does send her regards and her regrets. Um, so let me first introduce Jennifer Rich, seated next to me. She is the executive director of the Rowan Center for the Study of the Holocaust, Genocide, and Human Rights, and assistant professor of sociology. Now, we at the LePage Center have a, a custom and tra tradition not to uh, create paper handouts that invariably go into the trash or in the recycle bin. Um, so we do put our information about the scholars on these slides, and then if your phones are still on, on silent, uh, we encourage you <laughs> to look up more information online about our speakers. Um, our seated next to her is Devin Pendis. And he is a professor of history at Boston College. You'll see his full impressive bio there. His research is focused on war crime trials after World War II, particularly in West Germany, West German Holocaust trials. And seated next to him is uh, our faculty director of the LePage Center and assistant professor of European history here at Villanova, Paul Steggi. Uh, Paul is uh, focused on history of everyday life and has done uh, scholarship on Germany in the 20th century in Berlin. And we're going to begin the evening by learning a little bit more about our scholars and sort of where they come from on this, on this question and topic. And from there, we'll dive into the conversation. So for now, I will go back to Jennifer. And Jennifer, allow me to welcome you to Thank the LePage Center. Thank you. Um, so maybe just the easiest way to get into this conversation is for you to tell us a little bit about um, the center that you direct and a little bit about your research and your area of study. Sure. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Jennifer Rich. I'm the executive director for the Rowan Center for the Study of the Holocaust, Genocide, and Human Rights, which is a bit of a mouthful. Uh, we're a relatively new center at Rowan University in Glassboro, New Jersey. We have uh, sort of multiple foci. We, we look at uh, certainly the Holocaust, also other genocides. We're expanding into human rights. One of the questions we're asked most often is, so what? We're learning about the Holocaust. We're learning about other genocides. What can we do about it now? And so we've made the, the decision just this semester, actually, to really uh, switch our emphasis a little bit and push into to human rights to answer that so what question that, that so many of our students have. Uh, my own research focuses on Holocaust memory, both in terms of transgenerational memory. So what, does, what do the descending uh, generations of those who survived the Holocaust know, understand, remember, and also Holocaust education. So I came to sociology by way of education. I was first an education professor. Before that, I was an elementary school teacher. And so I have a really strong interest in how the Holocaust is taught and remembered in, in school communities. 
So part of what we do at the LePage Center is focus on the discipline of history as well as the product of history. We like to say history is both a what and a how. So you come from a sociology background. So for maybe for those not familiar, what does sociology bring to this question of Holocaust study and Holocaust memory? What's the, what's the how there? Um, the how there uh, is looking at how uh, people and communities Acted, what choices people had, what choices they made, what sort of agency people took, even when they felt like they didn't have any choices. And so the perspective of uh, sociology is really on, on the people and the choices and the communities that were formed throughout the Holocaust and, and in any other uh, issue. And if I may put you on the spot just a little bit more, is there an example that you might be able to share of that off the top of your head from the research that you've done or from other work that you've done at the center, sort of how that question of choices and agency, uh, what's, a, what's an example that people might be able to put their, their minds around? Um, I think so. One of, one of the most common questions that I get in my classes that I teach is, are things like, uh, why didn't people leave? If we knew everything, if this is what was going to happen, why didn't people leave when they had the chance? And uh, you know, I'll often share stories of people, of uh, families in, in the Holocaust who started to leave their hometowns and made the choice to go back. And, to, and with things like, you know, the devil you know is, is always better than the devil you don't, or this is as bad as it can get. And that would be um, one example of uh, agency that people had and their understandings at the time and um, reinforcement between community members. So one family talking to another family who heard a rumor from somebody who lived somewhere else. Um, and that's how decisions were made when people didn't know uh, what, was, what was ahead of them. So. Um, you know, another example of community, uh, thinking about my own research and children and grandchildren of survivors would be the communities that are formed um, in the, within the second and third generation, how uh, people think about the shared community, the shared history that they have. Um, so that would be another example. Wonderful. Thank you. And we will get into much more of that as the conversation unfolds. Uh, Devin, I'll put you on the spot next. Sure. Welcome to the LePage Center. We're delighted to have you here. Maybe you could tell the audience a little bit about your research and, and how you approach this, this topic. Sure, thanks. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me here. Uh, it's my first time at Villanova, so I'm very excited to be joining all of you. Um, I guess the easiest way to explain my research agenda is to say that I, am, I started life as a historian of the aftermath of the Holocaust. Right, um, sort of um, the question of like this horrible thing happened. Now what do we do? Right? How do we respond to this this awful event? Um, and you know, much of that focus has been on legal attempts at redress for this criminal trials in particular. I've also done a little bit of work on reparations uh, as well. Um, trying to, and denazification, trying to look at this question of how do um, societies, mainly Germany, right, as a perpetrator nation, but also to some lesser extent places like Israel or the United States where they are not perpetrator nations, um, how they've tried to use the law and criminal justice to, to respond to this. And from there, probably less relevant for our conversations tonight, I've expanded into kind of questions around kind of general strategies for responding to mitigating mass violence. So I do a lot of human rights history. Uh, I do a lot of history of international law as well, right? Um, also, though, very directly relevant for tonight's conversation, I've also done a lot of work on the historiography of the Holocaust, right? What historians have said about the Holocaust, how our interpretations and our understandings of the Holocaust have evolved since, not just since 1945, because Jewish uh, individuals in the Warsaw Ghetto were already writing the history of the Holocaust while it was ongoing, right? So since the time of the, the Holocaust itself to the present, how, how have our interpretations changed? So I've done a fair bit of work on that as well. And um, I wonder very briefly, uh, when it comes to the legal aspect of it, is this something where there's been interdisciplinary collaboration with attorneys and legal historians? And what are some of the disciplinary intersections there? Yeah, so um, one of the things I do regularly that's very interesting is um, every other year I teach a course for judges in the state of Florida, of all places. Um, 
It's nice, they have beaches, I don't object. <laughs> um, right. But as part of their continuing judicial education, and so I teach a course on law and the Holocaust for judges. And it's, a, it's very interesting to hear the kinds of questions that judges bring to the table uh, and the ways in which those are, are different than what historians would ask, right? So, you know, as a historian, a lot of times I'm asking also questions about agency and, you know, what choices did people make? Why did they make those choices? The judges want to know what the rules were uh, and whether the people were following the rules, right? And one of the exercises that we do that's, that's both fascinating and slightly disturbing um, is I distribute sort of brief case studies of criminal cases for so-called mixed race sexual relations during the 1930s in Germany. And I present the facts of the case to the judge and then I ask them, you know, well, how would you interpret, and I present the, the anti-miscegenation laws and the Nuremberg laws, and how would you respond to this? Uh, and then I then show them how this was actually handled in, the, in a real uh, court of law. Um, and you know, for the most part, the judges being good judges would apply the law, which is kind of horrifying when you consider how unjust the law is. On the other hand, it raises, and we, I, we discuss this with the judges a lot, would you want a world in which judges just willy-nilly said, I think that's an unjust law, I'm not gonna follow it, right? I mean, how, how, how far down that rabbit hole can you go, right? And so it gets to, it creates really serious kind of ethical quandaries of, you know, do you enforce unjust laws? How unjust do you have to think they are before you refuse to enforce them? What are your options? Do you resign from the bench? Do you stay on and try and make things less bad? You know, all of those kinds of questions. Fascinating. Well, we'll get into more of that, I'm sure, throughout our discussion this evening. And finally, let me introduce our colleague here at Villanova, faculty director of the LePage Center, uh, Paul Steggy. So Paul, same question to you, putting you on the spot. So how do you enter this conversation? So, <clears throat> excuse me. So I would describe myself as a historian of everyday life. Um, and I fo focus especially on Berlin. Um, and in terms of thinking about everyday life, sometimes it's hard to imagine ordinary life or everyday life as being something that is at all pertinent to talking about this, this horrendously violent criminal act at the middle of the 20th century. Um, and, and I think that, in fact, um, looking especially at, at violence and the ways in which people make sense of and tell stories about and, and participate in and acts of violence, um, what I think is really important to underscore is that, that violence and horrific violence and tremendous crimes don't depend on, on monsters or don't depend on people who are in, in extraordinary situations, but but the real question of, of Nazi Germany and of the Holocaust is how so many people found it so possible to integrate this kind of violence, this kind of killing into their ordinary lives. Uh, and so that's, I think, where my perspective comes into this story. And um, you actually teach a class on Nazi Germany here at Villanova. Um, so maybe you could talk a little bit about that class as well and sort of how do you, how you do that in a classroom with students and, and bring up these types of questions with, with students and people studying the Holocaust. So uh, this is, my starting point for this class is very much in terms of thinking about, um, about exploring the humanity of the people were, whose history we're exploring. And by taking seriously their humanity, that is both um, victims and perpetrators, Germans, um, um, uh, Jewish Germans, um, Poles, people from all over Europe, um, Americans, and to think about the ways in which they um, were in some ways very familiar to us, that their stories, their experiences, their choices, their desires um, uh, are not going to be an exotic other that we kind of look at and, and say, well, how could we imagine any sort of connection to that? But in fact, what is so unsettling is the ways in which their stories, their experiences um, make a lot of sense. Um, and, and I always think that the best history is not the history that draws a line under the past and um, tells us what we should know, but rather is the history that, that unsettles the ground beneath our feet and, and, and forces us to ask questions about, about ourselves. 
Um, and so I think that's very much the, the ways in which I try to pose questions and, and unsettle um, our, our complacency, even if we're fairly comfortably in Villanova in the, the first part of the 21st century. Great, thank you. So I hope that gives you a little bit of a window into the scholarship that we have, the expertise that we have. I'll put our slide with the live tweeting information back up as we sort of dive into the conversation in case people want to participate in cyberspace. Um, in some of our other events, I've actually done a little bit of polling of the audience, so I'll throw some of it in here now and throughout the conversation. So I'm, I'm just curious, you know, for, for those of us here in the room, how many of you are sort of actively aware that there is continual new scholarship on the Holocaust? Show of hands. Okay. And how many of you kind of think, well, I, I thought that we knew everything we needed to know already about this? Anyone? Show of hands. Okay, um, so it, I want to start maybe with you, Devin, and sort of bring it back to this question of revision and sort of the revisions of the scholarship from a historiographical perspective. So if you could, um, everyone here seems to know and assume already that the scholarship on the Holocaust continues to be revived and expanded. Could you give us a little bit of a history of the history, mm -hmm. a, a brief summary? Yeah, um, uh, yeah, to, I'll try to keep this very brief. I could drone on for a very long time about this, but I, I will spare you. Um, so, broadly speaking, I would say for much of the post-war period, there were two strands of Holocaust historiography. One was a history of Jews as an element of Jewish history. How did Jews um, respond to the Holocaust? How did they resist? What kinds of strategies for survival did they pursue? How did they die? How did they make sense of the deaths of them, their loved ones, right? Um, and, the, and this treated this very much as an aspect of the longer history of the Jewish diaspora. Sometimes it could be quite explicitly Zionist uh, and, and plugged into the creation of the State of Israel. Sometimes it could remain much more diasporically focused and much more kind of interested in kind of questions of cosmopolitan Jewish identity in the diaspora, but it was a distinctly kind of Jewish history. And then there was a history um, that was the history of the perpetrators, and generally told as an aspect of German history. This could be written, and often was written, by Jewish historians, but it still situated the story very much within the kind of the history of modern Germany. Right? Where are the origin points for German anti-Semitism? Where are the origin points for Nazism? Does this go all the way back to Martin Luther? Does this begin with 1918 and the defeat in World War I? What are the decision-making processes that lead Germans to decide to exterminate Jews? These kinds of questions. And these were relatively um, distinct and unconnected historiographies, and there was at times at least some degree of hostility between these groups. You know, a lot of German historians were very mistrustful of survivor testimonies as a source, for instance, thinking that they were overly emotional, overly biased, right? Um, a lot of Jewish historians were quite distrustful of German historians thinking that they were Germans. Uh, and, and, um, and in some cases, they were relatively agenda-driven, right? And it turns out you know, some of the prominent German historians of the 1960s, it later turned out, had spent time in the SS at the end of the war, for example, right? So there was a lot of mutual distrust uh, across those historiographies. I would say, you know, in recent years, really only in the 2000s, um, beginning with the work of a really important historian named Saul Friedlander, you've started to get what he termed integrated histories of the Holocaust that try to bring together um, the history of the Jewish experience of, of murder and survival and Jewish responses and the perpetrator side of the story, the story of the dis German decision-making process, the German initiatives that led to this. Um, because of course, these were not separate events, sort of by definition. The Jews were not merely reacting to German initiatives, right? There was an, there was an interaction uh, that went on there. And so trying to bring these histories, um, not just into dialogue, but as aspects of the same story Right, is, has been a really important development to try to overcome that sort of early bifurcation. Um, the other thing that's happened that has been um, also very important, maybe somewhat more controversial, has been to situate the history of the Holocaust in terms of a broader history of genocide, right? Uh, and to say that this is 
an example of a broader, more general phenomenon in the way that, you know, World War II is an example of the history of war, right? Uh, and yes, there are distinct developments of it as, as a specific war that's different from World War I or the American Civil War, but it is still recognizable as a war. So the history of the Holocaust as genocide um, does something similar. It says this has shares recognizable features with other instances in the history of the world um, that we can learn from comparing these, not to efface the differences, in fact, precisely to highlight the differences, the ways in which it is distinct from other uh, instances of genocide, but also to recognize the commonalities. And at least in some cases, some historians have argued that it is one instance of a kind of an ongoing genocidal process of the dissolution of multinational European empires starting in the late 19th century with the, the slow motion collapse of the Ottoman Empire in the Balkans and stretching through into the early 1950s, in fact, with the ethnic cleansing of Germans from Eastern and Central Europe that is a kind of a process of what one historian, Donald Bloxham, has called, has called the unweaving of Europe so that it's, it's a, a particularly radical instance of a bigger phenomenon. That has gotten some pushback, uh, as one might expect, from people who, who would argue that the, the Holocaust is, if not you know, radically unique, certainly um, quite distinct from other processes of, say, ethnic cleansing in the Balkans, for instance. So that, that, that remains a controversial position. That was great. I think there should be a five minute YouTube video with you <laughs> giving that. That was fantastic. Thank you. Well done. But I wonder, Jennifer, how that strikes you. You've got genocide and human rights, I believe, mm -hmm. in the name of your center. So um, you seem to be sort of at the later stages of this development where, where other questions of genocide and human rights are integrated into what you do. Talk a little bit about how that came about and how you see the Holocaust within these other dynamics. Uh. Sure. So uh, just between us in this room and anyone who's watching at home, um, we, we've had a, a huge debate, actually, about the, the name of our center and whether it's repetitive to say Rowan Center for the Study of the Holocaust, Genocide, and Human Rights, whether the Holocaust and Genocide are repetitive of one another. Um, it, uh, fundamentally, we've landed on a perspective uh, of saying, at least for now, though I suspect these conversations will go on for months, years, <laughs> decades to come. Um, the Holocaust is uh, both one of many and it's unique in its own way. And um, there is, because there are so, uh, um, some Holocaust education scholars talk about learning from the Holocaust and learning about the Holocaust. So learning about the Holocaust has to do with learning facts. What happened when, to whom, where. Learning from the Holocaust are these uh, sort of more nebulous lessons that we so much want to attach to Holocaust education. We want students to learn the lesson to be an upstander. We want students to stick up for the underdog, to question laws when they're just or unjust. Um, and so there is some, uh, perhaps some generality to what we can learn from the Holocaust as opposed to what we can learn about the Holocaust. Um, human rights uh, encompasses all of it in so many ways, right? When we think about um, human rights violations, uh, we see human rights violations in the Holocaust, in every other genocide, in mass atrocities, and so often um, in everyday life in ways we, when we think about um, uh, clean water or voting suppression. Um, so uh, human rights is meant to sort of give us a, a broader umbrella in which to think about these things. Mm -hmm. And Paul, one of the things we had talked about when we were putting this panel together was how much of these debates between scholars and these historiographical debates ever reach out to the general public, and, and should they? And I wonder from your perspective, as someone who's been in the field for quite a while, what you think about some of these debates that happen within scholarly circles, and then how it actually manifests itself in a broader populace, if at all. Well, I guess on, on one level, the fact that we have so many people in the audience tonight speaks to the ways in which scholars talking about this um, is of, of interest. Um, but maybe I guess the answer I would, would suggest is that um, the questions drive a lot of these conversations. Um, and rather than thinking about scholarship as a way of of formulating answers, to think about scholarship as a way of posing new kinds of questions. Um, so even in terms of, so I suspect not 
all of you, or maybe many of you, have heard about the, the Goldhagen controversy of the 1990s. Show of um, hands, Goldhagen controversy? A few. Yeah. <laughs> right, so, but this is, this is uh, about two historians who use a similar set of, of archival data and come to, the data. Data. Um, <laughs> and come to very different conclusions about what it means. Um, and there was a big debate that was also covered on C-SPAN at the Holocaust M M Museum um, and uh, overflow crowd. Um, and part of the question was about what, uh, about how do you look at these these people, these perpetrators, and what do you call them? Do you call them ordinary men? Do you call them ordinary Germans? Um, is there something particularly about their Germanness that led them to be so willing to participate in acts of mass murder? Or is it rather that there is something more generally ordinary about them that, that uh, kind of a variety of different factors of peer pressure and, and ideology and, and, uh, um, and, and a sense that they need to live up to the standards of the, the other men in their unit. Um, and that this is something that a lot of historians got very exercised about, um, and there was a lot of ink spilled about it. Um, but I think it has shaped the field in terms of thinking about this question of, of, of paying more attention not just to to extermination camps like Auschwitz, but also to pay attention to um, police units who were engaged in killing in, in uh, the countryside of, of, of Eastern Poland. Um, so to think about the ways in which the story of the Holocaust is happening in different places and involving different people, um, that gets pushed along by some of these conversations that initially seem just to be about um, you know, who's calling somebody names in their footnotes. <laughs> and you know, I think this is a relevant uh, strand of conversation for us at the LePage Center, right? We're a, we're a center that is engaged with scholarship and engaged with scholars, but our mission is public facing. So how do we bring that scholarship that happens inside of academic journals and debates at museums to a broader public? Uh, we do have a few students in the room, and I wonder if I can do another poll. For the students who are here, and by show of hands, how many of you learned about the Holocaust through your education somewhere down the line, whether it was in elementary school or high school? Actually, a good show of hands. And then how many of you have continued to do any research on this uh, in college here in Villanova? It's a couple of the history grad students raising their <laughs> uh, But I think that this is a good segue into this question about the, the sort of public memory side of the Holocaust, which is distinct, though drawing from the scholarship in the Holocaust. It's something I know that you've thought and written about. Um, Another question for the audience real quick. So how many of you feel like the, the, more, the most information about the Holocaust that you know has come from films, maybe from Schindler's List or uh, documentary films that you may have seen, Shoah, things like that, show of hands? Okay. So films, you know, I think they do play a role in what people know about the Holocaust. And you, Jennifer, have actually done some work on this. You looked at a particular film, um, which I will not spoil the name of, but <laughs> um, maybe you want to tell people a little bit about that area of your research and how film is used as a medium to teach about the Holocaust and what the pitfalls or shortcomings of that might be. Sure. So the film um, that has not yet been named that, <laughs> that I've written about uh, is a film called The Boy in the Striped Pajamas. Um, OK, I see lots of head shaking here. And I also heard that um, sigh groan. of frustration. <laughs> um, and uh, for those of you that don't know the film or, or haven't heard some of the broad uh, criticism surrounding it, The Boy in the Striped Pajamas is based on a book of the same title. Um, the, the book written by John Boyne has a, a label on it saying The Boy in the Striped Pajamas, a fable. The film does not. Um, it is the most watched movie in American public schools when it comes to teaching the Holocaust um, for two enormously practical reasons. Um, it has a PG-13 rating, and it's only 90 minutes long. So it makes, it makes the showcasing of the movie in a, in a classroom really practical. right? You don't need parental permission. You can show it in two class periods if you want to. Um, and because the film is shown so regularly, I have students who um, all the time when I ask, when I'm teaching Holocaust courses, and I say, what interested you? Why are you here? They'll say things like, well, I saw the boy in the striped pajamas in high school, and the movie changed my life. Um, and the, the problem with this movie is, I think some of you know, judging by your facial expressions, um, it's almost completely ahistorical. So it is set 
during the Holocaust. Um, it, the main character is a young German boy named Bruno, whose father is um, the commandant of a camp which Bruno refers to as Offwith, which we can assume is Auschwitz. Um, and as a viewer of the film, you sort of uh, follow the story of Bruno, who has no idea that uh, Jews are, are uh, a subhuman, um, even though as a, the son of a Nazi, he would have known this at eight years old. And he befriends a young Jewish boy who's imprisoned in Offwith, who has um, enormous amounts of time to just sit quietly by himself by a fence. And um, Bruno passes chocolate to this little boy, Shmuel, and they develop a, a friendship. And in the end, uh, both are, are murdered. And uh, viewers feel the mo they're uh, cr killed in a, a gas chamber, um, a gas chamber full of Jews, and Bruno, who is snuck underneath the fence. Um, and the viewer is sort of moved to tears by the fact that this young German boy has died, because that's where your sympathy lies at the end of the movie. Um, and you're not sort of tuned into what's happening to the, to the Jews and what their lives are like. Um, and uh, you know, so I, I would, I so often have this conversation with students when they come in, how great this movie is, how they learn so much about the Holocaust, how they know everything there is to know because they've seen this. Um, and at the end of a semester, we'll watch the movie in class with the, with the project of writing down everything that couldn't possibly have happened. And they sort of see it, it, that to me is sort of one reasonable way to use the film as a teaching tool once students have some sense of content to, to critically examine the movie. Um, and there are also probably lots of better choices uh, in terms of what might be shown in school, uh, ranging from the documentary uh, like Shoah to a Schindler's List, um, which you know some people might critique, but certainly um, has is far more historically accurate, um, but is impractical sometimes to show in schools. And it seems like this is a distinction between learning from and learning about, as I think you eloquently put it. So one might argue that this film, you can't learn much about the Holocaust. But you did say that people show up in your classroom as a result of seeing this film. So is there something redeeming in this learning from category for, for films like this or others, like The Piano, or you know, uh, where, where there is some sort of spirit of humanity that can be inculcated? Is, is that a useful way to think about the Holocaust? So I hesitate to say that there's a, a real upside for using the boy in the striped pajamas in a classroom because I, I, I don't know that there is. Um, if I had to sort of pick a silver lining, and I, I think that that's sometimes important to do, uh, it would be just that, right? That students then become interested and they want to learn more and it gives them the opportunity to sort of correct some of the incorrect narratives that they have um, sort of grown up believing about the Holocaust and the story. Um, is there a redeeming narrative? Um, I don't know. I'm sort of a, a little bit worried about this idea that we can learn about the Holocaust or teach about the Holocaust and have students walk out of our classes sort of feeling um, cleansed, like they've done something really good and uh, by learning about this, and, and then they're done. Um, it's that so what question that I, I sort of raised before. Um, so I, I, I'm unsure of exactly how I feel about uh, finding humanity in it. Um, yeah, I, mean, I, I would like to add one thing, which is that um, there is a real risk, I think, in, in teaching or, or you know, writing about or learning about the Holocaust, which is that what you learn from it is an empty moral platitude, right? Uh, and that you learn that I am not a Nazi, therefore I am not going to murder Jews in the 1940s in Eastern Europe, therefore I am unproblematically good and I don't have to worry about anything, right? And, um, and I think that these kinds of sort of universalizing fables around the Holocaust, we were talking before the event a little bit about Life is Beautiful, which is another film that kind of moves in that direction, right? Um, I mean, it's all well and good to say, you know, be nice. Right, um, but you don't necessarily need to have kind of the Holocaust as your backdrop for saying, you know, don't be mean to people, right? There are plenty of contexts in which you can do that. There are, I mean, I do think that there are kind of generalized lessons that one can and should learn from the Holocaust, right? but they have to be connected to the specificity of the event, right? They can't 
be kind of free, free floating um, pablum um, that that um, teaches kindergarten level morality, right? I mean, we can learn that in all kinds of other contexts. Um, Go ahead. Oh, uh, so just just very briefly to to build off of that, I think I would uh, maybe say one or perhaps two two things. Um, it's that it, so often in the context of teaching about the Holocaust. Um, we teach students, particularly younger students, stories of rescuers. Mm -hmm. And the question that teachers so often want to ask is, how many people here think you would be a rescuer? Mm -hmm. And there's only one right answer, right? <laughs> Every kid is going to raise their hand. No one is going to say, not me. You know, I'm, I'm going to leave my neighbor to their own devices, right? So there, there's only one one right answer there, and you really are sort of teaching kids. You're not helping them think through some of these gray areas. Mm -hmm. Why certain people made choices to rescue? Why certain people made choices to turn their neighbors in? Um, there were there was lots of context uh, around this. Um, and thinking and just my my second point, which I will make, um, are the themes that I think you know talking about lessons from the Holocaust or, or learning from the Holocaust, um, I would argue that those themes are things like um, nationalism, racism, xenophobia, anti-Semitism, not be nice to your neighbor. Oh, um, and I would say in terms of thinking about this, the, that one of, one of the most important things is just the realization that in fact this is possible. Um, and and, and I, just to pick up on the, this example you gave of you know, who would be a rescuer, um, this, this presumption, and I think there's a sense of distancing ourselves from mm -hmm. the Holocaust, is that, of course, we would be on the right side of this, this story, yeah. right? That, that we identify with the victims and that, we are, um, that by learning about this, we are presuming our place on the moral high ground. Um, and even in some place like, um, like the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., where, where you go through and you, you receive your identity card mm -hmm. that you open up at various places along the way, um, which is um, uh, to... Is, it makes a lot of sense in an effort of kind of breaking down this idea of millions of people being killed and putting a human face on it. And you get this, this, this question but at the end, well, does the person that I, over the course of this museum visit, have been identifying with, do they live or do they die? Um, in some ways, it would be a much more provocative um, exercise as you're going through is that you get your identity card. And um, it's unclear whether you are a perpetrator or a victim. And so you go through and you humanize your experience and you find out where you were born and, and where you went to school and who you married um, and where you did your military service. And, um, and then perhaps um, it challenges you more provocatively say, well, uh, so which camp did you serve in? Um, um, and, and that would probably be a very difficult museum experience. Um, but I think on some level, it would underscore the ways in which the lines between complicity and resistance um, are also blurred, um, and that that the real challenge, and I think the real um, the real benefit of exploring the history is to delve into these gray areas as opposed to act as if they're absolute moral certainties. And as someone who spent three and a half years as a curator at a Holocaust museum, which is myself, um, at the Museum of Jewish Heritage in Manhattan, I, I think there is a real there is a real balance that one tries to strike between about and from. And I think mm -hmm. a lot of the work on the curatorial side of the house, which is where I was, is on the about question. Mm -hmm. Who were the people? Where did they live? What were their stories? What are the artifacts connected with their stories? And then there's a whole another section of the museum, which is the education section. And the education section is really working on, well, what can we learn from this? How can we instill these lessons into classrooms? How do we train teachers? Um, and so in some ways, they are two distinct specialties, at least in a museum setting. And the challenge for any museum that works on a topic like this is to integrate that into some sort of meaningful experience for the visitor, which is which a tough, tough challenge. I think it's also a tough challenge for the sites themselves. And I want to bring Paul back into the conversation here to talk a little bit about the sites themselves, the Auschwitzes, but also the, the bergen Belsens and the Dachaus and some of the other camps that maybe lesser known, I think those places also have to wrestle with these questions of how much do our visitors learn about what happened here, and how much do we impart lessons, or try to impart lessons, uh, when people walk out the door about what they should be doing. Um, but of course, when people walk into these camps, they bring their own sets of knowledges and experiences, and sometimes they bring provocative questions that maybe the people working at the sites or the historians don't necessarily have great answers to. 
I think in the lead up to this conversation, uh, we had talked a little bit about some of the, the exchanges that are happening in, in camps now in Germany with the young generation of students walking through the door. So, so there have been a number of news reports in the last last few weeks about um, about conversations that are taking place, and and as some of the um, the guides in the camps were describing the provocative questions that were being posed by students um, that were putting challenging the existence of, of gas chambers or crematoria, um, challenging questions about numbers. Um, to some extent, they were locating these questions within the shifting political terrain of. Of, um, of Germany in one case um, that uh, they were reflected in the fact that one, one of the teachers was a member of the, the alternative for Germany, the, the right wing um, extremist party. Um, and so that this was saying that this is a, a par, a, an outgrowth of that political, um, political experience. Um, but it is this, this question about this, on the one hand, this obligation, this responsibility of going to the camp to learn, but then the question about um, about whether people are willing to, to do that or not, or is it just a sense of obligation of showing up and of checking the box? Um, and, and part of this is even in terms of how does one, when gets to these camps and goes and the experience of that. I, the, the, when I went to, um, when I was in Krakow, Poland, and went to the Auschwitz camp, I will never forget that the first, my first experience was getting off the train at uh, the Krakow station and uh, you know, with my backpack, and so obviously looking uh, fairly touristic, um, and, uh, and running into people as, taxi, taxi to Auschwitz, taxi, taxi to Auschwitz, right? And so, so that even in terms of this, this expectation that, that um, um, you're going to any of these camps, that, well, it's just another one of your destinations that you need to go as either part of your you know, your high school education, whether you're a kid in Germany or as part of your European tour, um, you know, you checked it off and, uh, um, and have done that. I, and I, I went, uh, went to Dachau in the afternoon. I'm in the Hofbräuhaus House in, in, in the evening. And, you know, Munich is great. Um, um, but, but I think that that's, that is precisely the, the challenge and that, that simply the camps themselves are going to the camps that the lessons don't go without saying. Um, and I think that that is precisely where historians and educators come in. Can, yeah, just jumping off of that, I mean, um, one of the things I think you asked a while ago about you know, the relationship between scholarly work and scholarly conversations amongst scholars and kind of public facing history and general people, I think this is a really useful reminder. Um, you know, historians in particular, scholars more generally, when you're doing modern stuff, the question is usually not what happened. Right? The question is usually why did it happen, right? The, 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 you know, the, the empirical information about what happened is usually pretty well documented. There's usually pretty broad consensus. I mean, there may be specific disputes here and there, but generally speaking, you know, there's broad consensus. It's very different if you do like ancient history or something where they don't have any clue what the hell happened half the time, right? <laughs> um, but you know, when, you, when, you get to, when you get to the 20th century, the documentation is so thick on the ground that the one isn't usually the thing that, that scholars are most um, interested in or most obsessed with. It's the why. But this public-facing site, I mean, you can't take the what for granted. I mean, in a panel on revisionist histories and the Holocaust, you know, we have to remember that that is a term that has been poached by Holocaust deniers to lend, you know, completely unwarranted legitimacy to their pernicious lies um, but the fact is that um, there is no dispute about the facts. There is ignorance about the facts. And we have to be clear um, that the facts are not in dispute. Then we can have these conversations about the why, where there's a lot of room for very legitimate dispute, a lot of room for very legitimate interpretive differences, right? Yeah, I think it's interesting because I think, uh, to push back just a little bit, I think there is still a lot of facts that we don't know, right? And, and so I think, you know, let's just do a little show of hands here. How many people are aware of Shanghai, China and its connection to the Holocaust? So fewer than half the people in the room. How many people are aware of the Dominican Republic and its connection to the Holocaust? 
again, fewer than half the people in the room. And I know Martina Grossman, who was supposed to be here, has done some work on you know, Iran and its connection to the Holocaust, refugees who survived or people who escaped the Holocaust who went all across the globe to various countries in South America or in the Middle East. So there is still a lot of what and a lot of facts to get at. And I think one of the ways I think we get into the Holocaust is through these individual stories, right? Mm -hmm. the individual stories of people who were murdered, the individual stories of people who escaped, stories of people who were perpetrators. And, and that seems to be a place where there's an infinite amount of what and facts to yeah. still uncover. I think the boy in the striped pajamas is, is effective for some people because it distills such a complex, awful thing into a singular story. As an educator and a teacher, uh, working with teachers who teach on the Holocaust, is that, do you hear anything about that? Do you hear anything about how you know, it's the one Anne Frank that can move us as opposed to the six million who died in, in the camps? Uh, the short answer is yes, uh, absolutely. I think uh, for all of us probably sitting right here, imagining six million Jews or 11 million victims or uh, nine million survivors or, uh, you know, just of the Holocaust, not thinking about World War II more broadly, uh, the numbers are sort of staggering, right? It, it feels almost impossible to take in the, the number, 6 million, 11 million, how do we sort of uh, think through who these people were, what they meant? Um, and so absolutely, a, a story, whether it's a fiction, a, a book that someone reads, a, a documentary, a survivor testimony, a film, it, it, uh, it sort of gets at the human experience in ways that numerical facts don't. And students, particularly younger students, really connect to want stories to hang on to as they try and make sense of, of the Holocaust or um, try to move closer to making sense of the Holocaust, because I'm not sure that it's possible to totally make sense of the Holocaust. Um, but it's those individual stories that are the things that do it. And I would just uh, maybe argue that there are uh, uh, other sources, primary sources, um, that can be used to get at individual stories as opposed to certain films or certain books. And I do want to make sure we get the audience into this conversation. So I think we're about five more minutes on stage until we bring you in. So please do begin to think about questions or comments that you want to add. Um, I want to stay on this theme of teachers, though, and, and how we teach effectively about the Shoah. Because you wrote another interesting article about New Jersey, which was the first state to mandate Holocaust education. And then you did a follow-up that found that the teachers actually had a very limited knowledge about the Holocaust, even after going through mandatory training and being told to teach it in their classrooms. Do we have a sense about what works then? If, if some of the things that we're doing are not working, do we have a sense about what, what could work or what is possible for Holocaust education moving forward? It's like the you know, million dollar question. You know, if, if, if we take as fact that so much of Holocaust education isn't working the way we want it to, um, as evidenced by my own research, by uh, sort of large scale studies done by the Claims Conference and the Pew Research Center, all of which seem to point in the same direction, that uh, young people and Americans more broadly are really lacking in, in their content knowledge about the Holocaust. So the question of what to do um, is sort of the question of the day just yesterday, the Never Again Education Act passed in the, the House of Representatives. Um, and so I think there are a couple of quick answers to that. Um, one is taking new scholarship and emerging and effective pedagogies or teaching strategies and marrying them together. So helping our teachers understand what strategies work when we're teaching young people about the Holocaust and also other hard histories, right? Whether it's the Holocaust, genocide, uh, slavery, uh, the Trail of Tears, right? How do we help young people think about these these issues, and how do teachers stay on top of emerging scholarship? If, as Jason argues, um, we still are learning the, the what. How do we help teachers learn that so that they're able to teach 
uh, their own students this information. And so I would argue that uh, universities, colleges of education in particular, museum settings have huge potential roles to play. Uh, and I would also argue uh, for meeting students where they are. So when I was learning to become a teacher, I had a supervisor who said that um, kids can concentrate in 15 minute chunks of time because that's when commercials are in television. Um, and now I would argue that kids sort of have a focus for YouTube video chunks of time or social media bits of time. It's even smaller than that. And so um, we might have whatever feelings we have about emerging technologies and kids' attention spans. But nevertheless, as teachers, um, I think we have an obligation to think about where our students are and, and how we want to move them to a place that feels more comfortable for us. And I've put up on this slide here to get us back to some of the questions we've been thinking about over the course of this series. And so you've, I think, touched on one of them, which is opening up the conversation and to be on in more platforms and more media where people may be consuming information. I think that also points to increasing the diversity of places mm -hmm. where people go for information. Um, I think, um, Paul, maybe you could talk a little bit about some of the expanding interpretations. I know in our lead up to this, you had talked about 1933 versus 1941, for example. It's sort of reshifting and reimagining how some of these interpretations about Holocaust and Nazism um, in the scholarship and in the classroom. Well, I think that this is this question of that every historian, whether they write an article or they write a book, they have to decide when to begin and when to end. Right? What's a, you have to you you can't tell everything, so you have to you have to make some choices. Um, and, and that is something that also reflects, um, as Devin mentioned earlier, the kind of evolving scholarly focus. Um, so it was the question to try to figure out, well, how did Hitler and the Nazis come to power? Or how did they launch the Second World War? Or um, now, I think, increasingly, in terms of trying to understand how Nazi Germany matters, is to think about, well, how did they come to perpetrate this genocidal uh, assault on Europe's Jewish population? Um, and and this is, I think, a point where it is very much a, a moving target. We were talking earlier, um, just today I was reading um, a, a new article that came out um, that was discussing the sources of Hitler's anti-Semitism and um, revisiting an interview um, that was conducted in 1994 with, the, with a woman who had been the daughter of the family that had rented a room to Hitler in Munich um, right before the First World War. Um, and so that this now becomes a new source, um, the suggesting, well, in terms of trying to figure out how these ideas translate into action. How do they move from this um, failed painter in, in, in Austria uh, to then become a political leader in Germany? Um, and it's messy and complicated, um, and it's hard, and there's lots of debates about what these different things mean. Um, but, I, but I think that this, th this is a great example of the ways in which, um, all right, looking at, at uh, a new source from the 1990s, um, can give us a new insight into say, well, what was going on in Munich in 1913 and 1914, and how should that matter for um, for this where we begin and end our stories? I mean, you know, there's no question that, um, as with any field of historical inquiry, the questions that historians bring to the table change over time, and they change the kinds of sources that people will, you know, that interview was from 94, right? But at the time, it was like, okay, there's this interview. But now somebody's coming along asking slightly different questions. Oh, this is actually a more interesting source than we thought it was. And in that respect, I mean, you're right that certain aspects of um, historical events, including the Holocaust, will become um, known in a way that they weren't previously um, will be sometimes rediscovered. People will go back to things that they used to be interested in then weren't interested in and are suddenly interested in again. You know, one topic that's really gotten a lot of attention in very recently is sexual violence in the context of the Holocaust, right? Which was something that was totally not talked about for most of the post-war period, right? Uh, but in an era where the, the question of sexual violence and, and, uh, is, is just front center in the public imagination, people are going back and looking at interviews and finding you know, information about this that was kind of there all along, but people chose to, to not focus on it, right? So, so you know, Holocaust history is no different than any other history in that regard, right? That we ask questions of the past 
because they are important to us in the present moment that we are living in, right? And someone who comes from a museum perspective, too, I would say that the, with the Holocaust, I think one can't escape the power of the artifact, you know, whether it's you know, a striped uniform or, you know, a, 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 a toy or a shoe or a hair, and all those things are our sources and they and they are such a part of the story of how we make this transition and the translation between scholarship and public understanding. Um, I had the privilege of going down to Sosua in the Dominican Republic to work at the Museo Judío de Sosua, which is the museum that documents refugees from Europe who wound up on the Dominican Republic uh, before the war. And to be the first person to look at those documents in 50 years it's a whole new a range of sources and artifacts that scholarship can be derived from um, and new understandings about this community can be formed. This is a whole universe of documents that we still have not fully explored and um, the documents and the artifacts are tremendous educational opportunities, I think, but they also have pitfalls and challenges. Um, I want to make sure we get you all into the conversation. What we're going to do now is we're going to bring the house lights up a little bit so that we can see you, you can see us, the cameras can also identify you. Uh, please do remember that you are on camera on C-SPAN uh, if you are asking a question. And um, I will repeat my, uh, my statement from previous events, uh, which some of you may have heard, but for those who are first timers, uh, we do audience feedback on all of our events, and when we send out our surveys, the number one comment we receive back from people about what we can improve on is to ask people to make their questions short or to make a short comment, as opposed to a longer soliloquy or monologue. Uh, so that's the feedback that we've received from you. So in order to help us make the experience better for you, we will request that you keep your question or comment brief, um, and you can direct it to an individual member of the panel um, or to all of us. And if you are willing, you can also identify yourself. <laughs> so we have two microphones on either end. So let's bring you into the conversation now. And uh, you feel free to raise your hands, and we'll go from there. There's a question. We'll start on this side of the room, a gentleman right here. Hello, uh, my name is Jerry Sinker. I have a question for the whole panel. It has to do with the number six million. How and when did historians settle on that number? And maybe there's a who in that question as well. I can, I can take that one. Um, the, the six million number was first used in the Nuremberg trials. Um, and it was uh, derived from a combination of German sources, so some kinds of things, some of the Einsatzgruppen killings in uh, the Soviet Union, for instance, they kept pretty good records, so we have a fair uh, sense of that. Um, some of them were based on pre-war estimates of populations and then post-war uh, counts of refugees. One of the big problems is that for a lot of Jews killed in extermination camps, um, the Germans didn't bother keeping records of how many people they were killing. Uh, so we have a very good count of the number of Jews who were enslaved by the Germans, and many of whom then were worked to death and died of horrible conditions in slave labor camps. But for the Jews who were sent kind of directly to the gas chambers, the Germans did not keep meticulous count of those. So there's a lot of kind of squishiness, I guess you could say, um, in some of these precise numbers. So six million is a ballpark. I have seen uh, credible figures as low as about 4.8 million. I have seen figures as high as six and a half million, right? So six million is a kind of a give or take uh, number with, with a fairly large error estimate, uh, but nothing lower than a, basically about five million would be uh, you know, the, lo the lowest credible uh, count that I've seen. It's an interesting question because I wonder from an educator perspective working with teachers, like how, how does that number function? Is that, does that number, the, the power and the magnitude of it, does that have some sort of a role in how teachers uh, approach the subject or um, deem the subject to be serious enough that it has to be taught in every classroom? I mean, is there some power in that number? It's an interesting question. Um, certainly there's a, a power to the number, but I think um, 
because it is so unimaginable in so many ways, it makes the teaching of the Holocaust to be enormously complicated. There's an urgency because it's so high. There's an urgency because when you uh, add other, other victim groups, aside from the Jews, to the number of victims in the Holocaust, um, the number gets higher. And I think it both makes it urgent and enormously complicated because it feels incomprehensible, particularly the younger you go, the harder it is to understand, you know, 100, 40 feels really big to you when you're a kid. Um, and so to think about 6 million is, um, feels impossible. More questions. Uh, we'll stay on this side of the room and sort of work across. So this gentleman here on the end. First of all, I'm a, uh, I'm a Catholic priest. I was stationed in Poland for 18 years. I was pastor of a parish, uh, perhaps about about five kilometers, six kilometers away from uh, from Auschwitz. My family, my mother's family, uh, perished uh, as Christians in the uh, in the camp, but. I would have a question for the audience. How many have relatives or related to someone who perished? Thank you. Thank you for raising that, I appreciate that. Uh, we have a couple of grad students on this side of the room with questions, we'll get them and then I promise we'll move across, so stay patient. We'll do uh, Kyle and then Thomas. Uh, hello, I'm a first year grad student and um, I kind of have a, a general question. It could be for any one of the panelists, but it mainly has to do with teaching and um, I guess combating um, Holocaust denial in your classroom. Um, this came up uh, last year in a class that I had where a professor was approached by a colleague who said they had students bring up um, facts that they learned like online or reading like David Irving and their response was they weren't really sure how to um, deflect these um, accusations from their own students about Holocaust denial. So maybe a question of what are some ways that you can combat these kind of questions in class? Um, so I'll, I'll start with this one, uh, both because Kyle was a student of ours um, in, in the past, and so I feel obligated to answer, um, also because it's, it's teaching. Um, and I also um, had the experience, I, I, I sort of know the situation Kyle's talking about, but also a situation in, in New Jersey recently, um, a teacher was fired for teaching Holocaust denial and he sued the school district and I was um, a witness in that, in that case um, on behalf of the school district who was uh, fighting against him and have given sort of enormous amounts of thought to uh, what happens when not only students uh, bring up Holocaust denial, but what happens when teachers sort of trade in conspiracy theory and denial. Um, and uh, one thing that I have, uh, there are sort of two, two schools of thought. One is the Deborah Lipstadt, I will, I will not debate a denier, um, uh, you know, from the, from the movie. Um, and you know this idea that you just sort of disengage the Holocaust happened if you can't accept basic facts, our conversation is done. Um, I think particularly with students who have perhaps um, been taken down weird uh, Google algorithm rabbit holes mm -hmm. and have been taken to sites like the um, you know National Historical Review, um, sites that have really uh, solid sounding names um, and they don't necessarily know how to tell the good from the bad. And so I think when you have students who are relying on faulty facts, there's a little bit more wiggle room to say, okay, I see where you've gotten this. Let me give you a stack this big of documents that are going to refute that and then let's talk about it afterwards and see what makes sense. Um, I don't know how you counter adults who um, 
our, our sort of trading and denialism and, and conspiracy theories, but I think um, with students in particular, you can in fact fight facts with facts. I mean, um, yeah, I mean, the only thing I would do is I would give a shout out to this um, webpage called the NISCOR Project, which mm -hmm. actually um, does, it's, so it's the opposite of the Lipstadt. I mean, uh -huh. it takes the denier arguments point by point and refutes them and provides um, a lot of the kind of the documentation and stuff that, so if it's a case where facts will make a difference, that's a really good resource for that. Um, if it's a case of, of kind of motivated reasoning uh, and, and facts won't matter, then yeah, then it probably makes more sense to disengage. The other thing that I would just say is maybe this is a plea for the value of, of doing history in a particular way, or maybe to say this, this is a, a call for a shout out to the footnote, right? To some extent, this is, this is um, a way to think about um, you know, providing you know, even if not actual footnotes, but essentially providing sources to support the work that we do. Um, and so that this becomes a way of both modeling, but also of, of, of providing evidence. So that you know, the, the reason why academic integrity is a big deal in university is not just because you know, we're trying to keep people from cheating, um, but it's also about putting together the architecture of where ideas come from. Um, and so by demonstrating where our our intellectual work on subjects like the Holocaust come from, then we can also um, provide a much denser and more fully fleshed out sense of, of the foundations of those arguments. I think, too, this is a, a good time to reinforce the fact that credentials matter. Right. And I think we're, we're unfortunately in a moment where there's a lot of ambiguity around credentials and credentialism and maybe even some populist pushback against okay. credentials and expertise. But I think we at the LePage Center and at Villanova and in the history department and, and more broadly feel strongly that credentials mean something and that expertise is important and, and should be valued. Certainly everyone can have opinions about things, but when it comes to actually having deep expertise on something, that's a different kettle of fish. Let's get Thomas, and then we'll move back over this side of the room to get questions from here. It's funny we started off going to credentials, because my question is based on the fact that one of the most well-known Holocaust deniers is Arthur Butts, mm -hmm. for, who is uh, not a historian, but he was an electrical engineering professor with a PhD at Northwestern. And my question is, how do we balance um, insisting on the fact the Holocaust happened with, um, <clears throat> and that there's certain th points that are history with making history accessible, maybe not to people like Arthur Butts, but keeping Holocaust history accessible while also insisting it happened and kind of keeping that argument in the forefront. Do you want to talk about Instagram? Oh, um, sure. Yes. VR. Um, and, and VR. Yeah, yeah. And all sorts of technology. So before this, we had a sort of two a two pronged conversation, and I I alluded to this a little bit when I talked about meeting young people where they are, right? Meeting students where they are now, and I used two examples. One. Um, of an Instagram, a, a series of Instagram stories called Eva's Story. So some people here might have might have heard about it. Um, and uh, I believe it was a filmmaker in Israel who did this. And uh, Instagram stories, um, maybe someone here can fact check me if I get uh, the definition of Instagram stories uh, a little bit wrong. But they are essentially um, short sort of video clips that can be posted on a fairly regular basis on an Instagram page account? Uh, uh, sorry. Um, so, um, and so there was this Instagram story, however it was posted, um, called Eva's Stories. And it chronicled um, the true story of a young woman who was murdered in the Holocaust through, and sort of portrayed her in the current day. So you saw Eva taking selfies and Eva out with her friends. And, and it was as if the Holocaust were happening now in, in lots of ways, while also staying true to much of her story. And there was lots of debate about this. And if it was appropriate, if it was horrifying, if it should be taken down and condemned forever. Um, and fundamentally, lots and lots of young people connected to this. It had you know millions of, of views and followers and or followers. Um, and yeah, students who were in my classes would also come and say, I saw this 
on this Instagram story, how real is this? And it opened up the avenue for, for lots of conversation about what's accurate and what's not because they were able to see themselves and make connections to this young woman in these videos. And at the same time, I think there is a tension uh, mm -hmm. with bringing serious scholarship and a serious subject into perhaps these more playful and mm -hmm. uh, modern platforms, right? I mean, there's been controversies about Holocaust video games, mm -hmm. right? People have tried to use video games mm -hmm as a way to teach about the Holocaust, and there's been significant pushback against that. I think there was even a video game that was shut down because it was mm -hmm. deemed to be sort of not the right tone and not the right message, too fably and, mm -hmm. and not factual. So I think it's a, it's a relevant question about balancing the new platforms and opportunities with the seriousness that the subject does, demands. I mean, it, it gets a little bit to this question about learning about and learning from, right? Because it's, you know, it's a question that, that historians wrestle with in general, which is what is the place of fiction in a history classroom, right? You know, uh, because by definition, fiction has made up elements, right? And so, you know, all the light you cannot see, would you teach it in a class, right? I mean, you know, any of these things, some of them are better, some of them are worse, some of them are great literature, some of them are not. Um, <laughs> But all of them have fictional elements, and you know, you know how. Um, what are the ethics of bringing any amount of fictional, you know, dimension into a story? The reality of which, which I think is you're getting out with your question, right, um, is is so profoundly important to acknowledge, right? And so, how do you say? We are acknowledging the reality of this, but in order to make it accessible, we're going to bring in a fictional, we're going to bring in selfies, or we're going to bring in, um, you know, uh, American tanks to the rescue, like in Life is Beautiful, or whatever it might what be. What about something like Mouse? How many are familiar with Mouse? Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So, I mean, how does that function in this debate about how, how creative and how, you know, imaginative can you get, but still be true to the essence of yeah. the story, right? Uh, you know, the other thing that we had spoken a little bit about before this, thinking about technology, is something that we're uh, working on at, at Rowan, which is um, we were sort of challenged to think about teaching and learning about the Holocaust by using virtual reality, um, which it, it, my, the first reaction that everyone gives is sort of this, <gasps> uh, and then I'll complicate it by saying what we have decided to do after really extensive conversations both inside the university and with other scholars is to recreate, recreate certain parts of the Warsaw Ghetto by using the documents from the Ringelblum archive, which was, I think Devin mentioned it before, um, Jews who were imprisoned in the Warsaw Ghetto acted as sort of citizen historians and took wrote uh, sort of diary entries, daily life type of reports about things that they were experiencing, how much food they had in the soup kitchen, how many people were there that day. So we're trying to do this only using, and then they were preserved so that generations to come could learn from the experience of these Jews who were imprisoned in the Warsaw Ghetto. And so we're using virtual reality to bring to life documents that were intended to be read by future generations, or at least that was the hope. Um, so there, and, and I think uh, our biggest question continues to be, where are the ethical lines here? What is ethical and what's not? How do we do this without it feeling cool or, or like a video game, but really using it as a teaching tool? Um, and so I think it's those ethical lines that um, it not keep shifting, but become more complicated as technology um, advances and as we move further away from the event. And so I think there's a, a balance of technology, scholarship, ethics, teaching, um, none of which I have really good answers for, but all of which we're really thinking about. Let's move to this side of the room, make sure we get more people involved in the conversation. Uh, you've been very patient, so we'll start here, and then we'll work to the middle, where you've also been very patient. <laughs> Hi, uh, this was wonderful. I'm wondering, do you know the movie The Reader and what your thoughts on that? I found it very powerful. I have. Okay, <laughs> you go first. Um, 
I'm, I'm not a fan um, uh, for what it's worth because, so The Raider, if you don't know either the film or the book, um, it was kind of a cultural sensation, late 90s, I want to say. Uh, the story is a young boy has an a young boy, a young man has an affair with an older woman uh, who turns out to have been a, a female guard in a concentration camp uh, who ends up then um, having done some bad things, right? Um, but it's also about uh, the core message is like he helps her learn to read and he introduces her to the classics of German literature and this is kind of a, a story of redemption and salvation for her and you know what I find troubling about that is the, the, the kind of the thesis of the, of the story, if it has one, is that German culture can save you from German culture um, and and uh, you know, and it, I say that as a joke, but it's also kind of, I mean, the, the, the problem emerges pretty clearly in and of itself, right? I mean, the, the question is not, you know, if only the Germans had read more Goethe, the Holocaust wouldn't have happened. The problem is that the Holocaust happened while the Germans were reading Goethe, right? Um, and, and that's really the, the, the question is why didn't reading Goethe prevent the Holocaust, right? And that's not how that question was framed in that book, and that's, so that's why I found that um, to be not entirely successful. And the one, uh, yes, I agree with everything that you said, and also think that it shows uh, shades of gray that can be complicated for people to think about, uh, students in particular to think about, right? So in what ways is the perpetrator in this film humanized, right? She's not one dimensional, she's not evil. Um, she did evil things, she did horrible things, but she also is this person who uh, loves and is loved in return and so uh, while agreeing that certainly parts of it are really problematic, I think there's something about the humanization of perpetrators and, and this, um, it, it makes it really hard to say, and I would never be that person. This is impossible. So that's uh, sort of one little uh, comment. And, and the other thing I would say, and this gets to the point to kind of the messiness when you get down to the granular level of everyday life and the ways in which the lines between actions um, um, that you try to assess and evaluate their their goodness or badness. Um, so I, I, my, my my work focused as, uh, early on on uh, post World War II Berlin, and in one of the debates in the um, Berlin Municipal Assembly, there was um, discussion and accusation of a socialist um, deputy um, and uh, accusation of essentially that he had collaborated with the Nazis um, because he had purchased the shop of a Jewish acquaintance so that that person could emigrate. So how should we understand this action? Is this an act of humanity to facilitate the escape of somebody from Nazi Germany? Or is this an act of collaboration that's contributing to the quote unquote Aryanization of the German economy? Um, and the answer is probably both. Um, and uh, it, it, the, the, the level of detail that I could access from the record didn't get down to the relationship between these two people and how that played out and whether we know, you know what was in fact informing this decision, that that's something that the record doesn't quite give us access to. Um, but I think that that is precisely the case that, that um, just because somebody was um, not a Nazi doesn't mean that one's actions were not contributing to the smooth operation of the Nazi regime. Um, or just because one was a Nazi doesn't necessarily mean that one couldn't do things that, that, that in individual moments also created opportunities for humanity or possibility. I think, too, this is evidence of how a good historian can ruin any movie that you want. <laughs> <laughs> and I say that a bit tongue-in-cheek, but I think it actually gets back to the questions earlier from our students, right? I mean, there are, there are ways that we want to engage with these topics, but it's not always in the classroom. It's not always at a panel conversation. Sometimes it is through a film and through a book or through an Instagram post. And so, you know, 
Sure, it may not be the exact right tone or message, but, but is there something that we can learn from all this? And, and in some ways, do these things as a collective still serve a public interest purpose by being out there and at least raising awareness, right? It would be worse if there were no films at all, um, I think. That's, that's my personal opinion. Let's get a few more questions. Uh, we've had a lot of men raising their hands. I want to make sure we have equal gender balance. So, yes, you. You've been very patient. If we can, let's, let's get you, and then we'll get my mother, and then a few other people. <laughs> Nepotism. <laughs> it's called moderator's prerogative. <laughs> Hi, my name's Janelle Monroe. I, um, I have a question. I spent some time with a German colleague a couple months ago, and we talked about... She had questions for me about how we have progressed from slavery and going through Jim Crow and Reconstruction and Civil Rights Movement and how she's been seeing a lot of the, the statues not being removed. And so my, and she asked me about the education of how we're educated about slavery and then she switched quickly to how we're educated about the Holocaust and German history in the US. And I explained the difference that I experienced in that slavery is a matter of fact thing that happened and that's how it was explained to me in the South. And that's, uh, that the Holocaust was a sad thing that happened that I don't know a lot about, but it was just a sad, sobering, and so I asked her similarly, but I have a, the question that I have for the panel is how, in, if you know, in, in German studies, how is the Holocaust taught there, and what can we glean from how they teach it there to also teach the Holocaust here, but also other sad events like slavery here mm -hmm. in America? You want to start? So, so I think what's, what's really similar about these issues is even regardless of the, can the difference in the, the distance in the past, that I think that these are two histories that both so in the United States and in Germany remain very close to the surface, right? So that, that they, are, they are present in lots of ways um, and, uh, and that continue to have, um, to remain significant parts of contemporary life. Um, I think that Germany, West Germany in particular, is off, was often held up, and now the United, reunified Germany is held up as a success story in terms of, of a, an effort to deal honestly and um, factually and conscientiously with a very problematic past. Um, and I think on some level that's, that's very true um, in terms of the ways in which it is part of the curriculum, it is part of uh, that, that this recognition that, that Nazism was wrong, not, Nazi Germany perpetrated horrific crimes, um, and that this is something that contemporary Germans need to continue to wrestle with. Um, what I think recent conversations have begun to really wrestle with is the ways in which the successful, successful civic education um, was also detached from personal experience. Um, so there was a book a number of years that came out that was called um, Grandpa Wasn't a Nazi, right? Opa war kein Nazi. Right? And so this idea that, that um, yes, you know, the Nazis, it was horrible, but the, it was the crimes, nobody's doubting that. Um, my, my grandfather, he, well, he was, just, he was just an ordinary soldier, and, you know, so he had nothing to do with, you know, those Nazis were really bad. It's a, you know, it's, it's good thing that, that we weren't one of them kind of thing. Uh, and I think that that would be the, the challenge here is, is the ways in which um, we can recognize, whether as a kind of personal family, but also institutionally, we have many more connections with these dangerous pasts. Um, and so I think one really good example is the question of universities, like Georgetown or Princeton or Harvard or Yale, who are confronting their connections to the legacy of slavery, not just in the South, right, but to think, or beginning to. And I think that, that, that those are some of the ways in which we can think about, it's not just something in the past, but our institutions in the present, um, their wealth, their traditions, their names, they bear lots of connections. Um, and, and I think that that maybe is uh, one of the cautionary tales about, about the success of, of Germany is the ways in which it also becomes depersonalized. And I, I would quickly add just the, the question of generations, right? I mean, um, the, the sort of the story of German success at dealing with its past um, is really a story of the second post-war generation, right? I mean, the, the immediate post-war era, the dominant story in German public life is we are the victims, 
right? Uh, we're the victims of the Nazis, who, you know, all four of them who started this horrible <laughs> war, um, right? And uh, we're the victims of the Allies who bombed our cities into rubble, and, you know, uh, we were really unlucky. We're the victims of communists, you know, right? It's only really in the 60s with the, the, the next generation that you start to get people with a much more critical kind of engagement with that past saying, yeah, there were more than four Nazis in the country, right? Maybe not my grandpa, uh, although there it was my dad, and there they probably were pretty critical of that. It was the 60s after all, right? Um, what's interesting now, though, is again, you're starting to see a generational shift, right? You already mentioned that, you know, um, Holocaust denial is, is making its face known in Germany in a way that it wasn't Previously, neo Nazis are, you know, you don't want to overstate this, I mean, you know, right, but, but they are more prominent publicly than they would have been 10 or 15 years ago, even, right? Um, and so, um, you know, progress on these kinds of confrontations with difficult pasts is not a one way street, right? You can learn lessons and then forget them or fail to train, you know, to teach them to the next generation, right? Uh, and, and that's, I think, again, part of what's important about this kind of work is making sure that, you know, lessons once learned are not forgotten. Um, and I, I would just add or, or argue that um, as many questions or concerns as we might have about Holocaust education in the United States, I would argue that it's probably still a lot better than the education we do around slavery. I think it is, uh, this is an overstatement, but I think it's easier for American uh, children, or uh, Americans in general, to think about horrors that were committed by other people far away, where Americans were on the side of right. And when we confront our own history of slavery. We don't have the safety of space. And so I think that um, there's an argument to be made that um, you know, we, do, we do better when it comes to Holocaust education than we do when it comes to slavery education. And we are running short on time, as I promised that we would end the event on time. Um, so we'll get one last question from my mom. <laughs> <laughs> and I know that there will be other questions that you want to ask. So we are going to actually have a dessert reception in the lobby. And so after the event concludes, I will invite you to join us in the lobby with the speakers where you can ask additional questions and gain additional insights. One quick thing I wanted to say in response to the question that was just asked. Um, I would say, you know, your question points to something we've talked a lot about at the Locate Center, which is how different history education looks depending on what state you're in. Mm -hmm. right? So I grew up in New York and learned a lot more about the Holocaust than I did about slavery. Mm -hmm. But the inverse could definitely be true for people in other states. And so a lot of this work that we have to do in the public interest is very localized. Um, I would say the other quick thing is we know a lot more about the victims of the Shoah than we do about the victims of slavery. And so there's a lot more what to uncover about the yeah, victims of American that. slavery. And I think there's a generation of scholars who are working on just that. So with that, the final question, uh, where did our microphones go? Ah, uh, yes. Right here, in the front. <laughs> Hi. Um, so I'm the daughter of two Holocaust survivors. I was born in a DP camp in Germany after World War II. And I'd like to thank uh, the entire panel for really a fabulous discussion. So I knew a fair amount because I went to a Hebrew day school. And we have family in Israel as well. But I never really appreciated how awful this was because until we went, Dan and I, my husband Dan and I went to Birkenau, not Auschwitz, because I think it's totally justified, but Auschwitz is vast. If you imagine smoke, smell, dirt on the roads, shouting, Nazis, dogs, complete oblivion for the people who came off the trains. So I think that even for someone like myself, an experience like that is really important. Now obviously, and then the other thing that happened while we were there is there was a survivor 
who was telling Israeli soldiers about his experiences in the camp. So these were young men, men and women from Israel, from the Tzava, who didn't really know anything about it. What I would suggest is in Europe, Hitler decided to completely exterminate the Jewish communities, some of them that had been in Europe for over a thousand years. And one way to teach kids or to make it more immediate, I think, and you guys know this better, is to appoint people in the room and say to them, okay, you guys are gonna disappear. The entire third or fourth or fifth of the class is gonna disappear. How do you feel about this neighbor or that neighbor? How do you feel about not having this person in your class? I think that's the only way you can bring stuff home to these kids because they live in a privileged world and it's really hard to make them understand this. So, uh, uh, I, I want to be really careful with how I frame this, but to say there are lots and lots of debates within education generally about the use of simulations like that. And my biggest caution or concern while I hear what you're saying and sort of wrestle around with this myself very often, um, and I'm asked this question um, on a really regular basis, is are we giving kids then some sort of false equivalency? Mm -hmm. I was a part of this in my class. I was disappeared, or I was asked how I felt when my neighbor was disappeared. And now I understand what it was like to be a Jew in 1939 Germany. Um, and so there is this thing that young people tend to do, um, which is to sort of put them, say that they can understand everything. Um, and so my, my pushback or my caution was something like that, which I agree in, in many ways would probably be effective and would really bring the message home, is that there is then this um, over-identification with something that thankfully, uh, our children right now in America can't understand. Um, and it's a, both a blessing and a curse that, that they can't. Um, so that's my only sort of bit of pushback to Jason's mom, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> um, One other thing is, is, is even just in terms of thinking about the different ways in which there can be experiences of a place like Auschwitz or Birkenau or Dachau, um, that it can very much depend on the time of day you're there, what the weather is like, um, uh, and uh, that, that, that there is not um, a single way that that can be experienced. Um, the, if I had to say, point to, to one Holocaust memoir that I would encourage people to read is Ruth Kluger's Still Alive, A, a Holocaust Girlhood Remembered. Um, and one of the things that she wars against is kind of the musealization right, of the Holocaust, kind of even in the camps of rendering them sort of museum-like. Um, and she said she would never go back to Auschwitz because it could not be like it was when she was there. Um, and so I think that I mean, there's this part of this is a challenge for all history, that, that all history is a kind of an approximation. Right? And Devin brought up the question of fiction. Um, and, and there's a way in which all history requires a certain amount of imagination or inventiveness. Um, and I think the challenge for all of us is to try to navigate that balance between making connections, fleshing out stories that we have only in a fragmentary fashion. Um, but I think at the heart of all this needs to be to recognizing the humanity of the people that we are, that we are talking about and whose stories we're trying to tell um, and, and to acknowledge that and, and to recognize how complicated that is. Um, and just very quickly to add on that, I mean, so part of the point of history education, history writing, right, is to imagine yourself in this past, to try to understand what it would have been like to be in this past. But when you're talking about you know, mass murder events, right, it creates certain kinds of ethical challenges for that act of imagination. Right? Whether you're trying to get students to understand the Nazis, 
right? Well, you want them to understand how Nazis think, but you don't want them to think like Nazis, right? Um, and so how do you, you know, make them understand that there was a kind of logic to what the Nazis were doing, albeit a you know, perverse and evil logic, right? And similarly, you want them to understand you know, what the Jewish experience was like, but you can't, ex you, you, you cannot walk a mile in their shoes, right? You just can't, uh, as, as somebody living in a, in a peaceful, prosperous, well-shod, well-clothed, well-fed, nobody's shooting at me kind of world, right? I can try to approximate an understanding of what that experience might, must have been like, but I, it is not my experience. I will not have that experience. And so we have to kind of um, respect the kind of the ethical distance Right uh, between the world that you're living in and this world uh, of of pain and terror uh, and death. Yeah, and uh, places have power, conversations have power, and I think scholarship has power, and all those work together. And that's that's how this process unfolds, and that's how we educate, and that's how we teach, and that's how we revise, and that's what we hope to do here at the Lopez Center. Create a powerful place that we can have powerful conversations. And I think we've had one tonight. So I thank you very much and join me in thanking the panel.